CFA Level 2 Economics, Economic Growth and Investment Decisions. This reading has six sections. First section is the introduction. This is less than one page, so I'd encourage you to actually read this section from the curriculum because it does a good job of setting the context. Section 2, Growth in the Global Economy, Developed and Developing Countries. This section talks about the prerequisites for growth and essentially what are the growth enabling factors in an economy. So factors such as having good capital markets and so on, good financial institutions. So those items are covered in section 2. Section 3 talks about why the potential growth or the overall long run growth of an economy matters to investors. And very simplistically, the case is made that if growth rate is strong in a given economy, then both equity investors as well as fixed income investors will do well. Hence, it is essential for investors to have a point of view on the expected potential growth rate of a given economy. Section 4 talks about the determinants of economic growth. Here we look at the production function and we spend a lot of time on the growth accounting formula and essentially here we look at how different factors such as capital and labor impact the growth rate of a economy. We start simplistically with just capital and labor and then also look at other factors such as R&D, different kinds of capital, infrastructure, development from the government perspective, how these other elements impact the growth rate of a uh, economy. Then we talk about theories of economic growth. Here we consider three theories, the classical or Malthusian theory, the neoclassical theory, and finally the endogenous growth theory. So most of the time is spent on the neoclassical theory. And finally, we talk about growth in an open economy. Here essentially the case is made that economies that are open, in other words, which easily trade with other, other countries and economies which allow free flow of capital generally tend to grow faster than closed economies. So these are the six sections in this reading. In terms of my videos, I have broken this reading into three videos. The first video covers sections 1, 2 and 3. The second video is based on section 4, determinants of economic growth. And then the third video covers sections 5 and 6. Section 2, growth in the global economy. Here we will consider both developed and developing countries. To set the context, the curriculum shows us the average annual real GDP growth in some advanced country economies as well as in developing Asia and then there are a few more segments. I have just taken part of the exhibit and we are going to look at something that is quite interesting. Now notice that when we talk about real GDP growth rate in percentage terms, then in advanced economies, the growth rates are relatively small. So if you take the US example, the growth rate is between 2 and 3 percent. In the 2000s, the growth rate has slowed down quite substantially. Whereas if you look at developing Asia, then the growth rates in real GDP have been huge in China. So approximately 10 percent since the 70s and 80s, moving on into the 2000s. So this growth rate has been tremendous. When we look at the real GDP per capita, which is a better measure of the wealth of a nation, we will notice that US numbers have increased approximately threefold from about 15,000 on a per capita basis to about 47,000. But look at what's happened in developing Asia. Let's compare the case of China and Pakistan. 
So notice that until 1970, the on a per capita basis, Pakistan was actually richer than China. But the growth rate in real GDP in Pakistan has been approximately 5% since 1971, which is about half the growth rate in China. So this tremendous double digit growth rate in China has had a tremendous impact on the wealth of China. So notice that in 2010, the per capita GDP in China is approximately four times more, 3.5 times more than the per capita GDP in Pakistan. So that's huge. As a side remark, the curriculum points out that these numbers have been adjust, adjusted for 2010 prices and are based on purchasing power parity. That's a side remark, but the key point here is that growth rates in GDP can have a huge impact on the wealth of nations. And as we'll see in subsequent slides, the growth rate of GDP also has a huge impact on both equity and fixed income investors. Now let's take a look at the factors which enable growth and these are a few standard set of factors that you will see in any development economics textbook. So the first major factor is savings and investment. So the idea is quite straightforward that one of the things that you need to enable growth is capital. Where does the capital come from? Actually, uh, another point related to capital is economies that have a high amount of capital will be more productive. So if you have a, if you have a farmer who is simply plowing the land using his bullock cart, obviously he is not as productive as a farmer who is using a tractor. So capital increases productivity, which, incre which in turn increases the GDP growth rate. So where does the capital come from? For capital, we need savings. So when people save, those savings are invested and that money, so the financial capital then can be converted into physical capital. So it is fairly straightforward. A general issue with developing countries is that people have low incomes, so savings are low, which creates a problem, but that can be addressed through foreign investment in a developing country. The next major item is financial markets and intermediaries. So the core point is that good and efficient financial markets can help enable growth. How? Number one, by allocating funds to projects with the highest risk adjusted returns. So basically this deals with efficient allocation of capital. Second, by creating investment instruments that facilitate risk transfer, diversification, and enhance liquidity. The idea here is straightforward. If we have these attributes in our financial instruments, then investors will be more comfortable saving. They'll be more comfortable putting their money in this system. And obviously, if there is more financial capital in the system, that can lead to more physical capital. And finally, Financial markets and intermediaries make it easier for companies to raise capital. So for a company that wants to expand, it's much easier to go to a financial institution and raise money rather than having to go to hundreds of individuals. Continuing with growth enabling factors, we have uh, the next item is political stability, rule of law and property rights. So this is fairly straightforward. In developing countries where you might have political instability, this creates economic uncertainty, which discourages the flow of capital. Property rights create incentives for households and companies to invest and save. So this is also fairly straightforward. If property rights do not exist, then obviously the incentive to save goes down. If there are low savings, then obviously we have low investment, low capital. Next, education and healthcare system. 
So this is again rather obvious countries with good good education systems will have more productive workers. More productive workers means higher GDP per capita, healthier people obviously will work better, work longer. So that has an impact. The curriculum makes a remark about different priorities in developing and developed nations. It is pointed out that developed nations are generally at the cutting edge of technology. So if developed countries focus on higher education, that will have a greater impact on their GDP. Whereas for developing countries, a focus on primary and secondary education is likely to have a more significant impact on GDP relative to investing in higher education. But nevertheless, obviously, investment needs to be made in education at all levels. Tax and regulatory systems. Here the point is that countries where the tax and regulatory system is such that entrepreneurship is encouraged, that's good for growth. If the tax and regulatory system is such that it limits entrepreneurship, then that is a negative. And finally, free trade and unrestricted capital flows. If this is happening, that's good. Here in the curriculum, a very simplistic view is given, which says that if there is lots of foreign direct investment where foreigners invest in, say, in, in setting up factories in a developing country, that's FDI, that leads to growth. Foreign portfolio investments, this is where foreigners invest, invest in equities, and fixed income securities in a given country or in mutual funds. So the curriculum points out that these are good things and gives examples of Brazil and India where once these countries decided to open up to foreign uh, capital coming into their countries, the growth in these countries took off. But there are other parts of the curriculum where we are warned about the some of the possible negative impacts of unrestricted capital flows. We covered this in the earlier reading. Now continuing, uh, let's talk about some of the factors which limit growth in developing countries. And this effectively is a mirror image of what we've talked about. So obviously low savings and investment will, will limit growth, poorly developed financial markets, weak and corrupt legal systems, poor law enforcement. I will also add corrupt politicians to this. We in Pakistan know all about that. Lack of property rights, political instability, poor public education and health services, tax and regulatory policies which discourage entrepreneurship, restrictions on trade and capital flow. So just memorize these items. They are effectively just the negative of what we have seen on the earlier two slides. Fairly straightforward stuff. Please now go and study example run from the curriculum. Uh, it is a simple example. One of the things that is done in example one is that you are asked to calculate growth rates. So that is a very basic calculation that you should have learned in level one. If you have issues with that, let me know. But hopefully it will not be a problem. Section three, why potential growth matters to investors. And here we'll talk both about equity investors as well as fixed income investors. Before we get into the meat of this segment, I just want to remind you of some basic economic terms, specifically the difference between potential GDP and actual GDP, and then nominal GDP and real GDP. These are basic terms, so if you are very familiar with them, you can skip this slide. Otherwise, pay attention for a few minutes. So to understand potential GDP versus actual GDP, think of the business cycle of a country. So if we draw a simple graph with GDP on the y-axis and time on the x-axis, if you take a country like China, the GDP or the output of the country has been growing over time. So as we just saw earlier, if you go from the 1970s to let's say now, the GDP has been growing rapidly. Now, what I have drawn here is a stable trend. This is, this is the potential 
GDP. This represents the output potential of China. The actual GDP at any point in time will be above or below potential. So there will be times when the economy is booming. So here the actual GDP is greater than potential GDP. There will be times when the actual GDP is equal to potential GDP and then there will be times such as this point here where the actual GDP is below potential. So here we are in a recession or the economy has slowed down. So as I'm sure you recall from level one or from your economics classes at some point, economies move in cycles and hence at any point in time we are either above potential, at potential or below potential. So when we talk about potential GDP, this is a stable long-term concept. So growing economies have a upward sloping potential GDP. And when we talk about the long-term growth of an economy, we are really talking about the potential GDP. So growth rate of an economy is measured typically by the growth rate of potential GDP. Actual GDP says, okay, this is the actual GDP at a given point in time. Now, another related note, when we have a situation like this, where actual GDP is greater than potential, then we have what's called an inflationary gap. So here the output, the economy is overheated. The amount being produced is greater than potential, probably because people are working overtime. So this creates a inflationary pressure. When you have a situation like this, where the actual output is less than potential, then we have a deflationary pressure. So that's the distinction between potential and actual D GDP. Important to understand because these terms are used frequently in this section. Next, nominal versus real GDP. Here again, the concept is fairly straightforward. So nominal GDP is the GDP with current price levels. Real GDP stands for inflation adjust adjusted numbers. In other words, if you take a country X, let's say that in 2001, the output of the country is 100 units and the price level is equal to 20. In 2002, the output of the country is still 100 units but the price level is now equal to 25. Now, in real terms, the GDP has not changed. So, in real terms, the output of the country is still the same, but in nominal terms, the GDP has gone up from 20, has gone up from 2000 to 2500. So, the increase in nominal terms is purely because of changes in price level. Now, in 2000, Three, you might have a situation where the economy does grow because from 100 units we go to 120 units and the price level let's say goes to 30. So here again there is an increase in nominal GDP but that increase in nominal GDP is both because of an increase in the real GDP as well as the increase in price levels. Generally, economists prefer to talk about real GDP because that is giving an indication of what is actually happening. So now getting into the meat of this segment. The core point is that equity and fixed income valuations are closely related to growth, the growth rate of economic activity. So as we mentioned in the introduction, if the economy is growing, then obviously your equity prices are going up and your fixed income securities are also becoming more valuable. But what is the relationship between, the, between economic activity and equities? Now this graph helps us understand the picture. This is a, a graph which shows us the US corporate profits as a percentage of GDP. Big picture is that there is a close relationship between the two. And for the US, we see that this, this line over here is, the, is showing us the corporate profits as a percentage of GDP. Notice that this 
corporate profits as a percentage percentage of gdp is generally up and down above uh, around the 6% level so this tells us that in the long run we have a 6% ratio here that us profits will in general be 6% of gdp and this gdp is the potential gdp so as the as the gdp grows so will the corporate profits in the long run the corporate profits and gdp will grow at roughly the same rate there might be times when corporate profits are high relative to that 6% number there might be times when co corporate profits are less than 6% of gdp but on average we are at 6% so let's look at this point a over here where temporarily corporate profits are higher than 6% of gdp what will happen here now remember gdp is a measure of the output or it is the total income in a economy if earnings are relatively high that means people are working hard but they are not getting paid for their extra work because uh, income is relatively low if they are not getting paid eventually they'll slack off and the ratio will come down now that's a very quick high level explanation but the key point is that in the long run real earning growth cannot exceed the growth rate of potential gdp so that's the key point to remember now let's look at this a little more formally and here is a relationship that is given in the curriculum the aggregate price level of stocks is equal to gdp multiplied by the aggregate earnings of companies divided by gdp multiplied by the pe ratio where again the p represents the aggregate price of stocks and e is the aggregate earnings so notice that algebraically the gdp and gdp cancel out e and e cancel out so this is obviously a, a, a equality so the point that we made on the last slide and one that i'll emphasize over here is that in the long run the price level of equities will move up the same way that gdp is going up and these two items the earnings per gdp and pe these might fluctuate but in the long run their effect they they will be effectively one so in percentage terms these items are not going to create too much of a difference the co long term relationship is between the growth in gdp and the price level of equity so this is the key part now let's look at some data the curriculum gives us the decomposition of the s&p 500 returns between 1946 and 2007 so that's fairly long term data we are told that during this period the s&p 500 returns were 10.82% of this 10.82% we are told that the dividend yield is 3.67% which means that the yield or the the prices have gone up approximately by 7.15% so 7.15 and 3.67 will give us 10.82 notice also that the gdp growth which is the the nominal gdp growth is a combination of the real gdp growth and inflation so if we combine these two numbers we are saying that the gdp has gone up by 6.95% so the increase in stocks 6 per year and the increase in the nominal gdp 6.95 are quite close which is what we are being told over here now where is the difference coming from look at the earnings divided by gdp and the pe ratios so their combined effect minus 0.12 and 0.2 so this 0.2% is a very small number notice also that there is a lot of standard deviation so a lot of variation associated with these two small numbers 
So what that tells us is that a lot of volatility in the stock returns is coming because of these two elements. So this basically uh, what we see here is the data is confirming what we said on the previous slide, which is essentially that in the long run, there is a very stable relationship between the increase in prices of equities and the growth rate of the GDP. Next, let's look at economic growth potential and how fixed income investors need to look at this. Here, again, the relationships are quite straightforward. If we have a situation where the actual GDP growth is greater than the potential GDP growth rate, so this might happen temporarily, then we will have inflationary pressures. So this goes back to the picture that I was drawing earlier. So if you have a certain potential GDP growth rate and if the actual is more than potential at some point in time, then that will create inflationary pressures. Why is this important for fixed income investors? That's fairly straightforward. You saw this at level one. If we have high inflation, that is a huge issue for fixed income investors. High inflation reduces the value of your future, the real value of your future cash flow stream. So high inflation would mean the value of your fixed income security becomes less. If we have high potential GDP growth rate in a given economy, that would mean that we have high real interest rates. High real interest rates would mean that we would have higher expected real asset returns. High potential GDP growth generally improves the credit quality of fixed income securities. This is fairly obvious in any economy where you have high growth there the chances are that the companies that have issued fixed income securities will tend to do well they'll be generating cash so the fixed income investors need to have less of a worry hence the credit quality is better differences between potential and actual gdp impact monetary policy so we saw this at level one where when we have a situation like this where actual GDP is greater than potential that creates inflationary pressures and obviously the monetary authority will try to to pull back and put some brakes on the economy that will impact potentially interest rates and inflation rates. So as a fixed income investor, we need to be aware of this. The growth rate in potential GDP is one of the variables that entities such as S&P and Moody's look at when they assign sovereign debt ratings. So that's another reason why this is important. And finally, potential GDP growth rate relative to the actual GDP growth rate impact fiscal policy. And again, Understanding fiscal policy is important for fixed income investors because it can have an impact on government spending, which can have an impact on inflation. So we don't need to get into too much detail there. As long as you understand at a high level the points shown on this slide, especially the first couple of items, you are in good shape. Now, you need to do example two in the curriculum, which is mostly based on material related to equity, but there is a question also on fixed income. So as long as you have understood the material covered over the last few slides, you will have no issues doing example two. The explanations are also very good in the curriculum. So make sure you understand this before you move on.